Aloha and welcome to Hospitality Hawaii. My name is John Kanching. I'm your volunteer host for a bi-weekly show live streaming on thinktechhawaii.com where I have the privilege to talk with industry leaders and other businesses that are related to our very, very important visitor industry. Um, our guest today, as you may have seen the tagline is Hawaiian Airlines, innovative and trustworthy. Um, I'd like to introduce my guest. Um, he's a uh, very well-respected professional in the field. His name is Avi Manis. He's the Senior Vice President of Marketing for Hawaiian Air. Um, but before I bring Avi on, um, I'd like to tell a little bit about my experience with him. I guess now over the last uh, eight or so years, when I first met Avi, I was with another company, actually with Hilton Properties in Hawaii. And we had a number of meetings with Avi and the team as they were finalizing their routes and their promotions and their marketing as they were opening up China, Japan, and some of the other domestic routes. Um, and through the years, um, Avi has continued to do extremely well with Hawaiian Airlines, uh, increasing his areas of responsibility. And so it is a privilege to welcome Avi Manes, Senior Vice President Marketing of Hawaiian Air. Welcome, Avi. Aloha, John. Thank you for having me, and it's great to uh, it's great to see you. Great, great, great to see you again. And uh, it's been too long. And and maybe we can start by you sharing with the audience some of your background. You know, coming from maybe where you came from before coming to Hawaiian Airlines, and how your areas of responsibility has progressed to where we are now. You know, eight, ten years later. Sure. So I. Uh, Came to Hawaii and Hawaiian Airlines from New York, where I had been a, a management consultant working uh, with a number of companies on questions of strategy and growth, and came to uh, came to Hawaii and to Hawaiian uh, now almost 15 years ago wow. uh, in 2007. Uh, so it's been a long journey, uh, and I've done a number of roles at Hawaiian on the commercial side, including uh, pricing and scheduling and revenue, and most recently uh, marketing and brand and product and uh, a number of other areas, including loyalty as well. Great, great. Thank you for that, Avi. Now, I, you know, we have a lot of different things that we want to talk to you about, but, but maybe let me kind of set the stage. And, and obviously, we, want, well, we don't want to dwell in the past because the purpose of the discussions is not to really talk about the past, but look at the present and into the future. But being that 2019 and 20 were just uh, an unbelievable time period for all of us in the industry, and, and not just obviously the visitor and airline and related industries, but but for so many other industries that are that are connected to what what we do. I mean, we saw business start to slow down at the end of 19, uh, as more information about the COVID came around, and then it really started to people started to get really concerned about it in January, February, and then obviously the bottom fell out in March when it was declared a pandemic. And you know, I know from the Hawaiian Airlines standpoint and all your other fellow carriers, there was a lot of reduction in routes. Uh, then hotels just started closing up one by one by one by one. And um, maybe you can talk a little bit about that, with, about what, what were some of the thoughts that were going through your leadership team that, at Hawaiian Airlines and maybe the airline industry as you started to see the softness in 19 and then into the full-blown pandemic in the spring of 20. Yeah, well, we were coming off what had been a really great year uh, for Hawaii tourism uh, in terms of overall volumes and visitor numbers and revenue. And so um, the airline was in a, in a very good place. And I think it came uh, relatively suddenly when you think about it in retrospect. And I think we all remember where we were in, in late February and early March as it became clear that we were going to have to shut down first parts of our network. Um, and then really looking up to the entire network uh, as a whole, uh, we knew that we were going to have to continue operating uh, and uh, providing essential air service, both within the islands of Hawaii, where it's obviously part of the lifeblood of the community, but also keeping us connected with both cargo and passengers to the places um, on the mainland and in Asia that we serve. And so then the question was, how do we do that safely? And it was a period of time in which our understanding of COVID was evolving very, very rapidly, and we were constantly having to change our safety protocols. Um, it was incredibly important that we keep our, our guests and our employees and our community safe while providing essential air service. 
And I have to give just extraordinary credit to all of the employees of Hawaiian Airlines who at a time when we were all thinking about what this meant for us and our families and our jobs, um, we're out there every day working in very rapidly changing conditions, uh, whether we're talking about flight attendants or our cargo folks or the mechanics who are maintaining a fleet that was for the first time largely parked on the ground. Um, everyone did a really extraordinary job under uh, very uncertain circumstances. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was actually really interesting uh, from the hospitality side of it, seeing all the different things that the airline companies were going through. And, and, and you have to say, I mean, the airlines seem to be leading the charge uh, with safety protocols, whether, you know, all the different spraying and the airplanes, uh, the inspection and the review of the air filtration system and so forth. Uh, and it was great to see that. Um, it was, you know, it's one of those things where it was really one of the examples of what a great community this is, because we were all learning from each other. And I remember being on the phones with my counter on the phone with my counterparts at hotels, uh, and we were all asking each other questions. And the airlines, who are incredibly competitive commercially, and I think the hotels are the same way. Um, we all got together and figured it out because you know safety is an area where we don't compete. Safety is an area where we all collaborate. And so there was a great, a huge amount, especially in those early days, of collaboration between all of the constituents in the in, in the visitor community and between competitors as well. So so fast forward to now, right? Now we're we're pretty much a year from what happened um, when when the worst started happening. And through that time, I mean, you know, everyone saw images of airline, you know, cleaning crew, cabin crews in full hazmat suits and with those big spray guns and spraying everything. Um, you know, different carriers took a third seat uh, empty or every other seat empty policy and no fight would be booked more than X percent. Fast forward now a year later, where do we stand now with, with your company relative to the safety protocols and your, your booking guidelines? Yeah, so we've learned so much over the course of the pandemic about the disease and how it functions. Uh, so there's a lot that we're still doing and some things that we're not doing anymore. We're still very, very focused on cleanliness because we know that that is important um, to our guests. So surface cleaning, the electrostatic spraying, uh, even though the evidence is increasingly showing that um, there's not a huge risk of transmission from surfaces, it's still very important to the overall experience that um, cleanliness be our, our, our focus. So there's a lot of focus on that. Mask wearing and adherence to mask wearing, we know now is one of the primary things that we can do um, to ensure that the aircraft cabin environment, which is already very safe, stays even safer. And so uh, really making sure that we equip all of our frontline employees with the tools to enforce our mask wearing policy mm -hmm. is something that's very important and I think mm -hmm. here to stay for a period of time. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, fortunately, the, 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 the most important thing as it turns out to making air travel safe was something that was already there, which as you mentioned, are the air filtration and circulation systems on an airline, which really make it one of the, uh, on an airplane, which really make it one of the safest indoor spaces I think you, can, you could have been in during, um, during COVID. So, uh, very uh, stringent measures are still in place. Uh, and now a lot of focus on how we make this process easier for travelers. So how do we take the requirements around testing, uh, vaccination to the extent that vaccination is going to be an option and make the information available to travelers so they know how to do the right thing and then make uh, access to things like testing as easy and as affordable as we can so that people do the right thing more often. You know that uh, when the state of Hawaii started their safe travel program, which I believe it was effective October 15th of last year, that must have required a tremendous amount of coordination um, at, through all the stations across the country, uh, Hawaiian Air stations, as well as Honolulu, right? Can you, can you talk a little bit about that and how that's progressed over the last maybe now eight, 10 months? Yeah, so we worked very closely with the state and the other airlines to try to make sure that on day one, it was as good a process as it could be. And I think uh, there's still a lot we can do to improve um, the overall experience. But there were a couple of things that were really important. First was making sure we got the right information to travelers. There'd been so much confusing coverage in the media and changes over time and different counties policies um, that it was important that we got people the right information so that they knew what they were supposed to do. That was sort of the first thing. Um, then it was really important to us to ensure that people had access to testing. When this started, 
Uh, if you think back, we were still having big surges on the mainland. There was a lot of medically necessary testing that was going on. And so it was incredibly important to us that we find ways to make testing available to consumers that wasn't competing with medically necessary testing. And so we partnered with different labs to do that. We built out over the course of the last couple of months. I think we now have you know, somewhere between 10 and 15 dedicated testing sites on the mainland for our guests that we've started up to make sure um, that there was access to testing, but also that we were trying to compete in that marketplace and drive down the cost of testing as well, um, because we know that's a barrier to travel. And then the last thing was just working with the state to make sure that the arrival experience in the airports was as good as it could possibly be when you're moving you know, a large volume of people through a space like an airport that wasn't designed for arrival screening. And so the state had to do a lot of work to adapt to that, and we wanted to help out as much as we could. Great. So, you know, obviously, I'm not saying this only because I've, I've got you as a guest. Uh, yeah. You know, Hawaiian Airlines has been serving, you know, the customers coming in, the residents of Hawaii, and employing Hawaii residents since 1929, right? I mean, I think I think I read somewhere where Hawaiian Air celebrated its 92nd year in service uh, early this January. So that, that's, that's amazing. But, you know, as I put on the tagline for the show, it was uh, Hawaiian Airlines innovated and trusted. And as a sales and marketing professional, um, you know, I know how important it is to, uh, you know, be consistent, be consistent with your message, uh, over communicate, uh, especially during these times, which which are unprecedented. And I got to say, just from my own personal standpoint, as a Hawaiian Miles member for many years, uh, Hawaiian Air has been amazing. I mean, not just the consistency of what you're doing, but but I think what was important, right? When people flights were being canceled, uh, it was important that the airlines come out and state their policy right up front. Right, what you were going to do so that people said, "Hey, I, you know, I'm I'm not going to be afraid that I'm going to lose my money. I'll at least have the credit, or whatever the case might be." Um, can you talk a little bit about your marketing communication? You know, maybe some of the discussions you guys had from a executive leadership standpoint, um, what your messaging was going to be during that time, and now, currently, uh, you know, I, I've always applauded Hawaiian Airlines for for their consistent marketing messages uh, about the new routes, about special fares, about added services. And, and I'd like to hear some of your thoughts. About that. Sure, thanks. And, and, and we have a terrific uh, marketing and communications team here. And, and one of the things I would say is over the course of the last year, we've had to continually adapt what we do to the circumstances. But I, in retrospect, the team put together a plan in April that, um, that covered a bunch of stages. And we really put ourselves in the uh, shoes of a traveler and asked what information was most important. So initially, as you rightly pointed out, the most important thing was just really tactical information. What am I gonna do about this booking that I need to change? And it was a period of time when you'll recall, both hotels and airlines had a really hard time getting enough people to answer the phones because there was this surge of demand for changes. And so how do we um, support our guests with the information they need right now? After that, there was a period of time where things quieted down a little bit, and we knew that people weren't really, it wasn't okay for people to travel at that point. We weren't really welcoming folks back yet, but we wanted them to feel some connection to Hawaii and to the brand. And if you had someone who had to cancel their trip in March, like what could we do on social media or email with content and video that would uh, give people away, especially when people were under lockdown and you know constrained in their houses, something to do that took their mind off the situation. And that was really our primary purpose. And then um, you know, there was a subsequent phase where it was around sort of slowly starting to welcome people back um, to get them thinking about travel and, and some of the concerns around cleanliness and safety and how we address those. Um, mm -hmm. And to talk to people about what it meant to visit Hawaii right now, what it meant to come uh, at a time when COVID was still a presence in all of our lives, how you could do that in a way that was respectful to residents in the community that allowed you to have a positive experience and so we had a whole series of communications around a theme that we called Travel Pono, which was um, very much about personal responsibility and what it <clears> meant <throat> to be able to have a meaningful trip to Hawaii right now. And that sort of continued through the last couple of months where commercial activity started to pick up and we've begun promoting new fares, new routes, and all the other stuff that we love to do again. 
great. Um, and and uh, I'll tell you, I love what your communication team is doing. So uh, look forward to more information about that. So, so the next question or next topic we want to cover is maybe a little twofold, right? And it's um, one, if you could talk a little bit about the new route. So, so recently uh, in the press, there's, there's actually been quite a bit of press about the new routes to, to and from Orlando, um, your uh, Ontario, California, and I believe coming up sometime this month. Yes. Uh, maybe in, in this week or maybe next week, right? Is, yeah. is gonna be your Austin, Texas route. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, maybe in sync with that, and I don't know if it's in sync or out of sync, is the ongoing concerns about um, more tourism. You know, do we have, you know, um, uh, you know, I think you might have seen lately in Civil Beat and on the advertiser, uh, a blurb or article about um, residents on Maui kind of retaking Wailea, part of Wailea Beach that had been kind of overrun by by visitors. And then there was something about in, in Kailua about, you know, not wanting to have as many visitors on Kailua Beach as well. So, so there seems to be some of that growing sentiment about what's the balance? How do we find that balance? And, and it could have been um, precipitated by the unexpected high demand in spring break, where you saw up to 22, 25,000 arrivals every day, um, still down from 30, 35, 40,000 per day in the peak. But nevertheless, I uh, mean, you know, I think that caught a lot of people off guard, you know, maybe not the airlines, because maybe people tend to book the airline farther in advance. But it seemed to catch everyone else somewhat off guard. Yeah, um, and I think you know it, it caught it might have caught us a little off guard too because I think the um, you know usually there's a booking curve where people book their trips in advance. That was very compressed because of uh, of the effect of COVID. And the people who are traveling now um, demographically are different than historically um, who's 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 been traveling to to Hawaii in the past. So I think um, it was a, a bit of a shock to the system. Um, we're still very, you know, as you pointed out, far below um, what we would have historically seen at, at a sustainable and comfortable level of visitors. But it's also the case that a lot of the infrastructure didn't open up in time. So restaurants were at limited capacity and a lot of them have closed. And so I think, you know, it, it, it was a place with activities weren't fully open. And so um, I don't think the infrastructure was quite ready for the surge that we saw right around spring break, which has now subsided very substantially. Hey, I'll be... Um... Going to uh, approximately, where's Hawaiian Airlines right now in terms of percentage of seats available in the market compared to the same time last year? Uh, yeah, I mean, if you were to compare us to, to 2019 for domestic seats, I think by summertime we'll be back up to about the same uh, number of domestic seats that we had um, at the same time in 2019. Now, of course, that has to be offset against the fact that we're still uh, operating considerably less inner island than we were before and uh, very little international. And so that part of the business hasn't come back. But the domestic part of the business, again, still not back to where it was before, um, but coming back at a faster pace than um, those other segments. Okay, so, so we'll get back to the, the, your comments on the routes, but, but you yeah. got a point about booking pace, very different booking pace and the demographics of that visitor. Mm -hmm. So, you know, spring break, has always kind of been dominated by North American business anyway, right? Mm -hmm. Because the Japanese peak is like the summer uh, and then the year end period. So um, so tell me a little bit about what you, what you guys were seeing from a change of demographic and then maybe segue into some of your, your um, what you saw with regard to booking pace. Yeah, so, uh, you know, the, the um... The mix has has been, uh, you know, younger, frankly, and more single uh, travelers than uh, than families, and that's kind of to be expected. I think it's less that that um, is a bigger group than it was before, and just that we have fewer uh, families and older folks uh, comfortable traveling at this point. And we expect that as vaccination proceeds right. on the mainland, um, our domestic mix is going to look much more like it was historically. But there's a there's a temporary shift. Um, because the folks who are traveling now tend to be tend to be younger and um, less concerned about uh, the impact of COVID right now. Okay, so you mentioned that um, your your seat capacity domestic wise is going to be pretty much what you had in the summer of nineteen. 
Is that because you're seeing that booking pace this far at this point, well, you know, well in advance, that'll justify that seat capacity? Uh, you know, I, I think we're starting to see, and it started, um, you know, in, in February and March, uh, stronger forward demand um, than we had seen before. Again, um, not something that would, uh, you know, rival 2019. And obviously, it has, needs a long time to accumulate to, um, to be full flights at the fairs that we'd like to see. Um, but we are we are seeing growing visitors, and I think I want to come back to something you you pointed out earlier. Um, it does underscore uh, some of the concern that our community has around the impact of tourism, and that's something you know I think we really need to have uh, more of a of a conversation about. This is um, not something I think that can be uh, pushed by the wayside again. It's not something where I think we can continue to exercise wishful thinking around. Maybe we can just have 20% fewer visitors who spend 20% fewer more, 20% uh, more. That 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 isn't something that I think is 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 realistic. And when you sort of know that because when you that argument's been made for a decade now, and when you push people on how we're actually going to do it, how are we going to make that happen? Um, there aren't a lot of satisfactory answers. So I think we need to be moving beyond some of the kind of Easy, easy answers um, to look at some of the really hard, hard policy decisions we might have to make in order to figure out how to make um, tourism sustainable and continue to be uh, a source of income for people in our community. And um, you know, I think there are a couple of things that I'll rattle a couple off, and then we can talk more. But I think there are a few things that um, ought to be thought about from a policy standpoint when we think about sustainability. And the first is really infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, the, the biggest source of friction that I often see is competition between residents and visitors for scarce infrastructure resources, whether that's parking or access to trails or space on beaches. And I think there are things that we can do to take some of the billions of dollars in revenue that, uh, that tourism generates for the state and reinvest it in infrastructure and management. Um, and you look at some of the experiments around you know, reservation systems for, uh, for over-traffic sites. Those are all important things that we can do to try to um, make tourism more sustainable and reduce the friction uh, and it, it imposes on residents. The second thing that I think is really important is equity. Um, it's very clear that tourism, the benefits of tourism, and we all benefit from tourism, who, those of us who live in the community, some of us indirectly, some of us directly, um, but the connection uh, is not as clear um, for, uh, for, it's not as clear for everyone, and we need to find ways to, to distribute the benefits of tourism more equitably. And the last is using tourism as an engine for diversification. We're talking a lot about diversifying our economy. Diversification should happen from points of strength, and tourism is our greatest point of strength. And so how can we use tourism to drive innovation and diversification um, to the kind of economy we want to have? So those are some of the things that I think we ought to be really thinking about. No, great, great point. You know, uh, uh, one of my best compadres in the industry and someone who I have tremendous respect for, Jerry Gibson. You know, um, you know, as you know, Jerry for the last few years had been very uh, vocal about the transit vacation units um, and hence uh, there were, you know, the, the bill, I can't remember the name, 89 or 18, whatever was passed in, I believe August of 18 or um, August of 19, one, one of those years. And and, you know, and that's what he, you know, probably contributed. He felt, you know, that there was 20 some odd thousand illegal, you know, transit vacation units in, in the island. So, so he kind of feels part of that organically by having reduced the number of TVUs in the state. Well, you know, would, would, and, and the hotels were all running in the 90% occupancies for the year, right? Record yeah. occupancy across the state. Um, so theoretically, I mean, it'd be difficult to, to, operate at a higher occupancy. So just that in itself, you know, would make it somewhat difficult for us to get back to that 10 and a half million level anyway. But, you know, that's interesting. There's kind of a segue also, uh, and, and as well, you know, as, as someone who's greatly involved in what's happening in the industry, recently the Senate, you know, Senator Wakai and discussion about further reducing the HDA budget from what it was back in the 1819 year of 108 million or somewhere in that neighborhood to the 78, 79 million they had in the 2021 budget to now 
maybe even dropping it further to somewhere in that $40, $50 million range. Um, what's some of your general thoughts about that? Um, you know, I, I mean, I think as a marketer, no one feels good about having less money, uh, but, but, you know, just some, some high level thoughts, you have. Well, I think, you know, there is absolutely a dialogue to be had about the strategic focus of uh, HTA and, and managing tourism and marketing tourism and how we go about that. And I think that that is a, 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 a good and healthy discussion, again, for us to be having at this point in time. Um, I, I think that discussion ought to be had. I worry a little bit about um, some of these things transpiring uh, and sort of gotten replaced bills and, and, and how they're happening. I think it's an important dialogue for us to have. And my hope is that the legislature who worked with the board of HTA to determine a strategic plan for um, HTA will continue to administer that strategic plan. And, and now is not uh, the time, I think, to cease investing in uh, the engine of our economy. It's a time when we need to be driving recovery. We need to be driving diversification. And you can't do that without some base of healthy industry from which to do it. And so I'm hopeful that we can continue this dialogue, that we can talk about what we need to do to uh, make tourism healthy and sustainable for the state, and also use tourism as the fulcrum to, um, to transform the state's economy. Okay, uh, good point. So, so um, we have maybe about four or five minutes left. So you know, give the viewers a little uh, touch about your thoughts on Orlando and Austin. I mean, Ontario, California is a slam dunk, right? But well, you know, what, about, what, about, what about Orlando and Austin? Nothing in the aviation business is a slam dunk, much as I <laughs> wish it were. Um, they're all big markets. They all have uh, a lot of uh, nonstop service, a lot of demand to Hawaii and no nonstop service. Uh, Orlando is a market that also has some demand from Hawaii there. And so we think that's going to be a great market. And Austin's a growing city uh, with a lot of people relocating from the West Coast, where we have a very strong brand and our product is well loved. And so um, we think that's a market that's going to continue to grow and be successful for us. Great. So uh, I think we've got a real short time left. If you took out that crystal ball from your desk drawer, Avi, as, as you look at the uh, balance of 2021 and into 2022. Uh, you know, back Smith Travel Research eight months ago was saying Hawaii wasn't going to be back till 23, 24, 25. What, what, what are your thoughts on that, G given what you're seeing? Uh, you know, I think that um, there is a lot of demand for Hawaii. There's a lot of pent up demand for travel in general. Um, and for us and for businesses, I think in this space, now is a time of opportunity and risk. And so um, it's an inflection point. I think we have to all be willing to take some risk and, and seize opportunities that we might not otherwise have done. And again, I think the biggest constraint uh, to the ability to sustainably regrow our economy is um, some of the policy questions and community issues. And we ought to be really tackling those head on right now. Right. All right. I think we've run out of time. Um, Avi Manis, Senior Vice President of Marketing, Hawaiian Airlines, did not disappoint. Uh, he provided his uh, honest uh, insight, professional insight on some of the things Hawaiian Airlines has gone through and, and uh, some of the interesting demand uh, that they're seeing, uh, not only the summer, but in the future. So, so I want to thank you, Avi, for joining us. I'd, I'd love to have you back, maybe with a panel, with Jerry, and maybe some of the other leaders. Um, but for everyone who's been listening, uh, again, my name is John Conching. This is the Hawaii Hospitality Show uh, every other Tuesday on the thinktechhawaii.com. Uh, you can log in. You can also watch the recorded show on the YouTube uh, channel as well. Um, and again, it, you know, we feel that it's an important um, platform to have not only our residents uh, involved in the industry and everyone who's not in the industry learning more about not just the high-level executive like Avi and others, but my future guests will include a lot of visitors, uh, excuse me, businesses and individuals that are associated with other facets of our industry. So thank you very much for joining us, Avi. We appreciate having you uh, as a guest and aloha and have a great afternoon, everybody. <laughs>